because they didn't have, you know, DVDs and stuff to, you know, pass around. Um, so it became big enough uh, that it was like that, and I think during his lifetime they actually built some, not exactly temples, but uh, retreat places. They, they'd had some of the first Buddhist retreats, or uh, the first retreats that he did were done in, in the woods, and, or done in, um, in existing structures, and they finally built some, some structures that were specially for that. So yeah, he did start it, and he did um, seem to have intended it to... Um, exist after he died. Um, but his also, his, um, his words when he was dying um, were that uh, you should be a light unto yourselves and um, even though I'm dying, uh, you, the principles that, that, I, that I've taught you, you know, should carry you uh, along. Um, I don't think uh, he ever intended to be worshipped. Um, he never claimed any sort of divinity or anything like that. Um, but it was a it was a popular thing. So, so yeah, I think there's a definite connection between Buddhism as it stands now and um, and what he set into motion. Um, it. You know, I, I heard somebody, I think it was Krishnamurti or somebody, no, no, who was it? It wasn't Krishnamurti, but it was somebody say, you know, because they don't understand bu what Buddha taught, there is Buddhism. And I don't think, I think that's a bit wrong. Um, because he did, he did found a, a, a kind of a institution, although it's a, it was a lot looser than, than much of what we have now. Actually, um, one guy said that, like, uh, from a psychological point of view, Buddha was probably one of the greatest psychologists of all time. And um, I remember when, in your book, you said that, like, when you do zazen, a lot of your neuroses start to come yeah, out to the forefront and stuff. And I think there's a comparison between what he saw with that demon king and, like, all these neuroses just coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a... Yeah. I mean, it's just, that's just an old-fashioned poetic way of describing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, because... Uh, I mean, before it, a lot of a lot of uh, Buddhist theory, um, not necessarily uh, well, some of it coming from Buddha himself, and some of it coming from later Buddhist teachers and and monks, um, it seems to predate modern psychology because they had the I, the idea of the subconscious, for example, appears in Buddhism hundreds of years before uh, Freud. Uh, I think Freud is the one who's usually credited with coming up with that idea. Um, so, so these ideas were, were present. Uh, the idea that there was a, there was kind of a, a, a part of the mind that, uh, that was, that operated at a level below, um, conscious awareness and, and so on. Uh, the, um, alaya is what they called it. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's connections with that. I think, I think Buddhism is, um, is quite comparable to a lot of um, psychology. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never know how to end my. Well, actually, I'm curious. Like, have there been stories of people doing zazen and having like this really far out kind of like hallucinations or fears that just came out of nowhere? Or something? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean that. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you my story of when it happened right over there, you know. I, um, I was at one of these, uh, one of the early retreats I, I came on and I'd been doing zazen. It's, it, it's funny, I, I hear these people, um, uh, some, nobody said it in this group, but some people, you know, who've done really hardcore retreats or really retreats where they do a lot of zazen will say that these retreats are very easy comparatively. But when I first started these retreats, I thought they were really intense. Uh, so maybe that was just my my point of view, but but um, but yeah, I, I you know went through this whole thing where where a lot of um, repressed stuff uh, came up all at once during a retreat, um, and I remember I was sleeping in this room over here, and and all this stuff was just like going, Wah, you know, uh, I wasn't hallucinating or anything, but I was having this uh, incredible panic attack uh, for no reason at all. Uh, I remember waking up over here in the middle of the night and just being absolutely terrified out of my mind and, and going, what could I possibly be terrified out of my mind of? There's just people sleeping here and it's, it's a temple, you know, it's as if there was uh, a tremendous impending danger that, that, 
you know, I better run away right now. Um, and I'm sweating and, and all this stuff, and I just kind of um, went over uh, to the to the main hall there, um, and kind of sat there for a few minutes, sort of going, all right, <laughs> calm down, you know, and sort of uh, deal with it. Um, but it was a really, um, I think it was a really good experience, even though it was incredibly you know, terrifying, in that um, because of the practice we do is very slow and very gentle, I hadn't been pushing for, for having any sort of experiences or anything like that. Um, so I kind of knew how to deal with it, which was just that this too shall pass, you know, that, that whatever comes is just going to uh, go away by itself eventually when you know, if you just don't keep adding fuel to it. Um, so that's what I did, and eventually I kind of you know, settled down enough that I could um, sleep after a fashion, <laughs> you know, and then get up and do more zazen. I was talking to another uh, Soto guy, priest, about this topic, and mm -hmm. he said that the uh, really great, groovy, euphoric feelings that you might get sometimes yeah. are also the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that definitely true? Yeah, yeah, and it's worse. like one's bad stuff, you know, yeah, yeah. good stuff. They're just the same stuff. Yeah, yeah, even even worse because that the the really groovy euphoric stuff can can hook you in because when you're terrified of the terrifying stuff, you know that you don't want to spend a whole lot of time there. When you get the really euphoric stuff, uh, there is uh, a tendency to just want to stay there forever because it's so great, you know. Wow, this is wonderful, you know. And I've had that too my, in my own personal experience, and and. Um, and it, I, I remember bringing you know some experience like that up to Nishijima Sensei, and he you know expecting him to say you know you have found the secret answer, my son, or some sort of thing, you know. And he told me you you work in the field of animation, which I don't, uh, and uh, well, I mean we do a little bit of animation, but anyway, everybody makes that mistake. But anyhow, and you see, you're just you know going off on your imagination, but you know I was convinced that I'd found the secret, you know, the answer, and. Uh, and and it was 42. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, you can get into that stuff. And I, I think, um, I mean, there are, there, are certain, um, there are certain problems that come with this approach of, of wanting to have these experiences. Um, this woman, Tonin O'Connor, who runs the Milwaukee Zen Center, was telling me about somebody she knew. Um, who had gone in for, for some kind of a practice in which they were very interested in having enlightenment experiences and so forth. And uh, this woman was basically having what most people would call a nervous breakdown, but she had all these people around her telling her, well, this is the, you know, you're, you're, you're beginning to, to, uh, to penetrate into the, you know, <laughs> whatever it was. You know, so, so she was like uh, pursuing this uh, and, and eventually ended up making her pretty nutty and it took her a long time to kind of get over it. So, yeah, you got to watch that euphoric stuff just as much. I mean, whatever happens, you just have to kind of pass it by and that, that is kind of difficult, you know, because you want to grab on to it. I believe you, somebody else mentioned that um, because of these things, you know, there's uh, you know these terrifying experiences and euphoric things that come from doing that, and it's uh, important to find it. Yeah. But um, you know, especially coming from a, a relatively Western background, I'm, most people here live in Japan, so there's some opportunity. But uh, I don't know. You know, sometimes it's quite hard. And on the other hand, a lot of times people are saying, "Well, just just keep doing zazen. The most important thing is to do zazen." And I understand from mm -hmm. a, from a practical exercise point of view, but like, if you can't find a teacher, or you know, or uh, for whatever reason are unable to, or, or not finding it easy to do, and you're supposed to be doing zazen, but then these things are going to come up. So what you, what's the right kind of balance for that? It's difficult. Yeah. Um... In, in most cases, if you're not doing a real gung-ho sort of like, I'm going to penetrate to the depths of reality sort of practice, um, the things don't come up that, you know, it, it's not like you're going to, you know, do, do a little bit of zazen for a couple of weeks and, and all of a sudden you're going to start having hallucinations and, and all. <laughs> so if you're, if you're doing that, then, you know, maybe your diet is... <laughs>